Hello and welcome to Gundry's Guides, episode 4, the tits. There are about 60 species of the tits family paraday worldwide, with 8 occurring in the UK. The bearded tit and the willow tit are not exactly common in northwest England, and the fabulous crested tit is only found in the Cairngorms area in Scotland, although I've only, although I've only ever seen them in Norway. So if this video I'll concentrate on the five common species, the blue tit, coal tit, great tit, long-tailed tit and willow tit. These fabulous passerine birds vary from 10 to 15 centimetres in length, although in the case of the diminutive long-tailed tit, the vast majority of this length is the tail. They're really not much bigger than a table tennis ball. So how do you photograph these? They will come to feeders readily, especially in winter, and you can get a kaleidoscope of them on a cold winter's day. If there's food available, you can get 30 or so coming to a good feeding station. Uh, the great tit is by far the larger and the more dominant of the five. You're going to need a long lens, 500mm or longer, ideally. Image stabilisation, ideally. Some sort of support, leaning the lens on the hides windowsill is fine. A few AF points aimed at the eye, and an ISO high enough to keep the shutter speed sensible. These shots were mostly on a 600mm Nikkor lens with a range of cameras, but some are on the University of Salford's Canon 90D and 150 to 600 mil lenses. I wonder how many hours I've spent at Pennington Flash and several other sites bothering these wonderful birds with a camera. They are really superbly attractive and characterful. I like to think of them as tiny little scraps of perfect beauty. Firstly, the Eurasian blue tit. With the UK breeding population of three and a half million pairs, and a European population of 20 to 40 million pairs. It is widespread, famous, and frankly very cute. With UK first year and adult survival rates of only 38 and 53% per annum, this species has high mortality rates and a short average lifespan. In other words, only 38% make it to adulthood, and only 53% of adults make it to the next year. Many of the UK population learned to peck open the foil lids of milk bottles in the 1920s, starting in the 1920s rather, but this is less common than it used to be because foil top full cream milk is a rare beast indeed outside UK homes in the 2020s. Another learnt behaviour, the propensity to peel off tree bark to find insects, has led to a habit of peeling off building materials as well. Blue tits have a range of calls, including contact calls to inform each other of location, Alarm calls when predators are located, calls associated with copulation, dominance displays, and the begging calls of chicks. A 2005 study shows that the blue tit broke away from the Paraday family relatively early, hence it is not a Paris species. And finally, here is the home range of the Euro Eurasian blue tit in red and the African blue tit in orange. Now the coal tit. It took me ages to learn the difference between this and the willow tit, and I've decided that the latter is, well, more willow coloured, while the coal tit looks a bit more like it fell out of bed without taking time to groom itself properly. This is wholly unfair, but the willow tit does look a little bit sleeker to me than the coal tit. Anyway, the various subspecies of the coal tit follow Bergman's rule, i.e. they are larger in cold areas, and only the Siberian birds have a regular migration. They're largely a residential species 12 months of the year in the rest of the range. They thrive as high as 3,500 metres in Bhutan, and their hopping foraging behaviour resembles that of a tree creeper. Some fascinating research by Bautista and colleagues on foraging has shown that the species will choose variable food supplies when they are nutrient deprived, this is likely because a non-variable food supply of the same average quantity would be insufficient for their needs. And they eat more if they are in the presence of tawny owl calls, presumably to the, prepare themselves for raised nocturnal attentiveness and activity levels. This is the opposite of what tends to happen with respect to diurnal, i.e. Um, daytime predators, where small birds tend to be a little bit lighter in weight to eat less presumably to maintain their agility for pursuit. The opposite seems to be the case for the presence of tawny owls at, at night. Finally, this map shows the global residential range of the coltit in red and its non-breeding range in blue. And now we move on to the great tit. This is the largest of the UK tits, but it's still only approximately 18 grams in weight. 
It is behaviorally dominant at a feeder and usually only loses scraps, as far as I can tell, to the nut hatch, which is very much top of the pecking order at the Pennington Flash feeders. The Great Tips has been a mainstay of behavioural ecology research for many decades, famously so at Witham Wood in Oxfordshire, where they have been studied for at least 60 years. The early pioneering work on the selective factors determining clutch sizes in birds was done on these species by David Lack and colleagues in Witham Wood not long after the Second World War. This led to Lack's principles in the 1950s, which states that the clutch size of each species of bird has been adapted by natural selection to correspond with the largest number of young for which the parents can, on average, provide enough food. In other words, clutch size is selected for to maximise the parents' lifetime reproductive success, and young that are too poorly fed to reach adulthood are no good for this. Equally, a small number of very well-fed offspring would reduce lifetime reproductive success. It is all about balance. Great tits are iteroparous, meaning they breed every season for a number of years, so it is their lifetime reproductive success that is under selection, not their seasonal breeding success exactly. Although, of course, the latter relates to the former. I'm not saying that these insights about the selection on clutch size apply only to great tits. They apply to all animals, in theory at least, although in some animals it is much harder to study than others. Measuring the lifetime reproductive reproductive success of a giant clam, for example, is well nigh impossible. Finally, here is a map showing the home range of the great tit, Paris Major, the Bocarensis subspecies, the similar Oriental or Japanese tit, Paris Minor, and the Cinereus tit, Paris Cinereus. Fourth in this episode is the Cutatel long-tailed tit. It has stunning pink, black and white markings and coral pink eyelids. The genus name derives from the word Aristotle used to name the tits in the 4th century BC. They are very social birds and form tight-knit family groups in winter. Their large nests consist of approximately 6,000 items, a mixture of over 2,000 downy feathers, plus large amounts of lichen, moss and spider egg cocoon silk. The structural stability of the nest is provided by a mesh of moss and silk. The tiny leaves of the moss act as hooks and the spider's silken thread provides the loops, thus producing a natural form of Velcro. The lichen provides camouflage and the feathers insulation. These nests thus represent a considerable investment in time and effort, so if one is destroyed later than approximately halfway through the breeding season and only 17% of broods survive to adulthood, largely due to predation, there is insufficient time to start again. In these cases, the pair will split and will often go off and help nearby relatives rear their young, which has genetic benefits, otherwise known as inclusive fitness, for those helping individuals, because they're helping their genes spread to the next generation by looking after their grandchildren, nephews, nieces, cousins, whatever. But how do they know who to help? It turns out that the chicks learn a family recognition call from their parents in the nest, so they will sound like family when an adult is potentially looking to help them out in future years. In some cases, 50% of nests have one or more helper, and helped nests have higher chick survival chances because of increased food provision and another adult being available to provide guard duty. Moving away from the wonderful research that has been done on this species' remarkable behaviour, I absolutely adore these tiny bundles of feathers. What wonderful creatures they are. Finally, here is the global residential range of the long-tailed tit in red and its non-breeding range in blue. With a worldwide population of 175 to 250 million birds, the beautiful willow tit could be as much as one-sixth as common as the most abundant species on Earth, which seem to be either the domestic sparrow or the red-billed qualia of sub-Saharan Africa. The willow tit excavates its own nest hole and can penetrate tough bark to do so. Fur, hair, wood chips and feathers are used for insulation. A study in Finland found the survival rate of chicks in the first 12 months to be 58% and year-to-year survival once adult is 64%. So the Finnish willow tit survives far better than the British blue tit. But of course this could be at least partly to do with differences between the two countries' relative suitabilities for the species and may not be entirely to do with differences in physiology and behaviour between the two species. Who knows? 
There is a slow global decline in the species abundance, while the decline in the UK from 1995 to 2017 was calamitous. An 83% decrease attributed to habitat loss, competition for nest holes, particularly from blue tits, and nest predation by the greater spotted woodpecker, which in the same period had increased its UK population fourfold. Thank you very much for watching. There will be another video soonish of flight shots of passerine birds with the Nikon Z9's wonderful pre-release burst mode helping a lot with this. But at the moment the plan for episode 5 is waterfowl so it's not two passerine videos back to back.